So Roger spoke uh, at great length, and I think Ken must mention this too, about cost sharing and, and cost sharing's role. And, uh, and this is uh, something that Roger referred to in part. The RAND health insurance experiment showed that, indeed, consumption of health care is responsive to price. There's a 10%, uh, a 2% reduction in utilization, according to the RAND health insurance experiment, for every 10% increase in copayments. Uh, another study has shown that higher copayment levels reduce the use of drugs for high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and heartburn. Uh, the reason that many people believe this is a problem, and Dana Goldman, among others, has written about this, this very thing, is that some of the drugs that actually represent extremely good values are the ones whose consumption is sensitive to price. And uh, actually, there may be a net benefit loss when increased copayments induce patients to stop taking some of these drugs. Roger has gone over the, uh, this issue of high deductible plans and, um, and their lack of features to limit high-end expenditures. Uh, I think that I'm going to disagree with him a little bit, though, by saying that this is not purely a matter of people with chronic diseases and long-term predictable expenditures. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Medicare claims files showing that basically anybody who gets a hospitalization gets into the high cost group. Uh, sometimes it's a single hospitalization, sometimes it's multiple. Uh, having a chronic disease puts you at greater risk, but it's not easy to pick out the people who are going to have high expenditures in a given year. Uh, but one thing that is very clear, uh, and this is only Medicare data, we have the best information about Medicare, but it, is, it applies as well to uh, the commercially insured population, is that expenditures are highly concentrated. And what you see here is that uh, more than 60% of the expenditures are attributable to 10% of Medicare beneficiaries in a given year. And if you go to the top 20% of beneficiaries, then we're talking about uh, on the order of 85% of all Medicare expenditures. The bottom line, though, is that these people tend to be over any kind of catastrophic threshold. Most consumer-directed health plans, uh, most plans that feature cost sharing actually eliminate virtually all effective cost sharing when you're over some threshold. And uh, therefore, if all you do is uh, use cost-sharing features to reduce low-end consumption, you do very, very little to reduce overall expenditures. So this, at least the current forms of cost-sharing, uh, cannot be considered to be a viable solution for rising health expenditures, at least by themselves. So I want to argue that coverage policy is going to be crucial. Um, and, and there are a few reasons for this. Obviously, the cost sharing is going to have some kind of limits. And in, in fact, the existing plans do such a poor job of capping the high end that, that it uh, seems very unlikely that we're going to start to see plans that introduce a lot more cost sharing at the high end. And people tend to leave these plans as well. So it's not clear how much farther you can do with, with the crude cost sharing we've seen. Managed care remains unpopular. The solution of the 80s was going to be managed competition with, managed, with uh, HMOs and other kinds of capitated or managed plans. Uh, and I actually believe we're going to see, we see some evidence already of a resurgence of interest in managed care, perhaps by another name. But I don't see this becoming the major fraction of the market or the solution for the vast majority of insured Americans. So. Uh, this is not at least a near-term solution. So coverage policy, and by coverage policy, I mean deciding what's in and what's out, what's covered, what's not covered, by an insurance plan is going to be crucial as a component of any uh, significant effort to reduce expenditures. And I just wanted to mention that one of the side benefits of co using coverage policy as a tool and I think it has more direct relation than, say, something like cost sharing, is that it creates incentives for the advocates for new technologies to produce information that will tell us whether or not they actually work, whether they improve health. Coverage policy has typically been used uh, in, in a deliberate way 
for determination of coverage of new technologies rather than existing technologies. We could talk about whether that's the way it should be. It's a fact of life. This is a decomposition of health expenditure growth that was conducted by the actuaries of the uh, Healthcare Financing Administration. This might have been from CMS, but I think it actually predates it. But this is a standard kind of decomposition they did that looked at the different sources of increase in health expenditures. So they first adjusted for demographic factors, uh, which historically have not really been an issue. That's this black part at the bottom. Uh, obviously, it'll be a different story when the baby boomers reach advanced ages, but that's accounted for less than 10% during any of these periods of the increase in expenditures. Then you have this, this uh, hatched area here, which is just economy-wide inflation. So this takes out the effects of CPI growth, basically. Then they have what they call sector-specific inflation. And uh, that is supposed to be a measure of the excess rate of inflation of medical goods and services. So you might think that you'd expect to have a, a higher growth rate for the prices of medical services because medical care, by and large, is labor-intensive. And insofar as wage growth exceeds the growth of general prices, you'd have an increase. Another cause, which David Cutler has written about extensively and very persuasively, is um, the possibility that we're mismeasuring price increases because mixed into these figures are uh, improvements in technology which were uh, not properly accounted for in the uh, indexing method. So David and his colleagues have shown that's a fairly significant factor in healthcare. In any case, this is something that's not likely to be amenable to direct policy control. So the last part, the lightly stippled part at the top, they've labeled here sector-specific other factors, and they used to label this volume intensity, and before that they called it the technology factor. This can be the growth in expenditures that occur because new technologies are introduced that are more expensive, old technologies are being, that are expensive are being used more extensively, or when MRIs were introduced, you might have had cancer patients getting now an MRI in addition to the CT scan instead of the CT scan alone. All of this fits into this residual category, which they call uh, sector-specific other factors. So when you want to look at what you do to control the growth in health expenditures, usually this is the component you want to focus on. It's not entirely accurate to say that it's all due to new technology. But it is not unreasonable to say it's due to technology diffusion, even of technologies that may be relatively mature. For example, bypass surgery, which continued to diffuse rapidly um, many years after its introduction. So that would show up in this component. And that is really the target of coverage policy. Now, how is coverage policy made? I'm going to argue that in the United States, and uh, in our discussion time, I hope we can talk about other countries a little bit. But in the United States, coverage policy today is almost entirely evidence conscious. That is, whether or not something is covered, given that it fits into a category that's not contractually excluded from coverage, whether or not something is covered is based on an assessment of the evidence that it's effective. For Medicare, coverage policy all derives from this section of Title 18 of the Social Security Act. That's the legislation that originally established Medicare. And it said that Medicare, uh, in the Medicare program, no payment may be made for any expenses incurred for services, items and services that are not reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of illness or injury. As an aside, I want you to note the negative language here. It does not say Medicare must cover everything that is reasonable and necessary. It prohibits Medicare for covering items and services that are not reasonable and necessary. Now, what does reasonable and necessary mean? Well, this legislation was drafted largely by lawyers, uh, and they decided to let the doctors figure this out. They didn't want to get in the business of defining what reasonable and necessary is. And it's fair to say that in the early 60s, reasonable and necessary meant whatever most doctors did. Uh, and then that changed over time. Commercial plans 
Bill Sage is here in the audience, and he's been very actively involved in this issue, defining medical necessity. But commercial plans tend to use language saying that they will cover care that is medically necessary. Uh, and Bill can give you a very learned and, um, and very sophisticated explanation of what medically necessary means, but basically it brings us into the same morass as the Medicare language. Boris, you're nodding your head. <laughs> no comment, okay. Uh, and, and again, medically necessary has usually meant prevailing practices, uh, at least in, in the past, but today most commercial plans like Medicare, use evidence evaluation processes. That is, they seek direct evidence of effectiveness, not necessarily the opinions of physicians or their prevailing practices. So the best established program, and um, one that's open in the sense that available to the public, is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association's Technology Evaluation Center. And um, this, this group, uh, which I've sat on for, I think, about 14 years, makes uh, determinations about effectiveness that are used in coverage processes for about 110 or 120 million covered lives in the U.S. So it's a fairly large program. And they use five criteria. First is a, a simple regulatory criteria, and they're only interested in stuff that is approved if it needs FDA approval. Um, the key ones are this, this criterion and the two after. First, there has to be sufficient evidence to draw conclusions. If this doctor over here says, I've tried everything else, and I think this treatment will work, and I know everything else failed, I gave it to the patient, it works, that's anecdotal opinion. That would not generally be considered sufficient evidence. Uh, usually, the evidence has to be something like a formal trial, preferably a randomized controlled trial. The technology must improve net health outcome, that is, compared to placebo or doing nothing. and it must be as beneficial as any established alternative. It can't be worse than the prevailing practices in terms of health outcomes. And there's a fifth criterion, which uh, is not invoked very often, but the improvement must be available outside investigational settings. So if there's one surgeon in the world who can do this procedure and secure good results, that's not enough to say that it meets these criteria. It has to somehow be replicable in the real world of patient care. What exactly constitutes evidence? There are endless debates about it, and I'm going to summarize a, a lot of that argument with just a few simple observations. As I already mentioned, anecdotes, opinion, poorly controlled observations, they don't typically have much weight in, in modern processes, although they historically have played an important role in shaping coverage policy. Randomized trials are considered the best kind of uh, evidence. Now, what I wrote here is previously entered in a registry, and, and for those of you who don't live in the clinical trials rule, well, I think this bears a little uh, discussion or explanation. What several researchers have found is what's commonly called the file drawer problem. Negative studies get buried. They get filed away and never published. And if you compare the universe of all randomized trials to the subset that get published, it turns out the average result in the uh, entire universe of trials is much less positive than among the published, published trials. So you're not drawing a random sample of studies that have been performed when you look at the literature. You're drawing an enriched sample, enriched in positive results. So the current trend is to require, and this has been spearheaded by medical journal editors, to require that every trial that's going to be published has to have first been enrolled in a registry so that people can track back and see which trials are not being reported and therefore recover an unbiased estimate uh, of what the effect is. So this is a change from what people would have said just a few years ago. It's not enough to be the results of a trial. This has to be a trial that we are convinced is drawn in an unbiased way from the universe of all trials, and that means it needs to have been entered in a registry. The, uh, the NIH actually runs a very large registry that gets hundreds and hundreds of studies entered a week uh, called clinicaltrials.gov. And so the results of these trials are very often combined in uh, what are so called meta-analyses, again, so that you can uh, look at the preponderance of evidence using all available sources rather than any one study. 
So how does this evidence-based process relate to controlling expenditures? What it's aiming to do is to ensure that the kinds of care that get covered by insurance and delivered by physicians provide a benefit. There is nothing about the evidence-based approach that explicitly says we're going to look at costs. This is from one of the preeminent proponents of evidence-based medicine, David Sackett, a clinical epidemiologist physician, who said basically that doctors practicing evidence-based medicine will identify and apply the most efficacious interventions to maximize the quality and quantity of life for individual patients, but this may raise rather than lower the costs of their care. So you might think that care that's of dubious uh, effectiveness, eliminating that is going to save money, and in a sense it will, that is, that's wasted money that you will no longer spend, but you may end up spending it on something else that does work better but costs a lot more. So there can be no assurance that this will necessarily lower expenditures. And one of the reasons that people who, who develop new medical technologies complain about the evidence-based approach also is that in the attempt to restrict what kinds of care actually gets covered, what kinds of care get delivered, the bar, the evidence bar, gets raised higher and higher. And this is a source of enormous consternation. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a big debate uh, about Medicare coverage of implantable defibrillators, also known as ICDs. And the cardiologists were saying these basically work for everybody. Medicare is looking at literally billions of dollars to pay for these. And they started worrying about, well, we should cover it for an ejection fraction below 30%. This is a measure of how weak the heart is, but maybe not above 30%, definitely not above 35%. And it seemed to the cardiologists that Medicare was splitting hairs. So there's a lot of complaint that, that the evidence bar is being raised in arbitrary ways. And this uh, achieved full expression in this article published in the British Medical Journal. It's, some of you may have seen this. And if you can read the, the, um, the title there, it says, Parachutes reduce the risk of injury after gravitational challenge, but their effectiveness has not been proved with randomized controlled trials. This is the abstract. Uh, I'm not going to, to read the whole thing, but very straightforward objective. Do parachutes, are they effective in preventing major trauma related to gravitational challenge? And they did a very comprehensive review of the literature, looking in all the usual data sources. They looked and looked. They were just looking for studies showing the effects of using a parachute. They had an uncontroversial main outcome measure, death or major trauma. <laughs> they couldn't find any trials. So the conclusion, advocates of evidence-based medicine have criticized the adoption of interventions evaluated by using only observational data. We think that everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute. I can't tell you how many times I've left meetings and heard people muttering words to this effect. <laughs> so obviously, when you push on the evidence criterion, you can have some uh, unintended consequences. And there are, indeed are times when you don't need that much evidence, at least in the form of randomized trial to draw conclusions, but this is the, the uh, corner we've sort of painted ourselves into when it comes to conventional coverage policy. So um, what's wrong is sometimes we confuse the lack of evidence with evidence that an intervention is ineffective. In my years on the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, process, I've involved with the Blue Cross Blue Shield process, and also on the Medicare Coverage Advisory Committee, the typical reason an intervention fails to meet these criteria is not that it's ineffective. It's that the evidence is insufficient. So evidence insufficiency is usually the main obstacle, not evidence that something doesn't work. Uh, and even if you have a trial, very often it's conducted in the wrong population. I can tell you that for Medicare, the big issue is you have lots and lots of trials conducted in middle-aged men, and you know very little about how well the intervention will work in a man or a woman, 65 years of age and older, much less the Medicare disabled or end-stage renal disease populations. Uh, those of you who are fans of statistics will recognize Economists are not so guilty of this. In fact, we are very undemanding when it comes to p-values. But 
The epidemiologist clinical trials look at the p-value, p less than 0.05, green light, p greater than 0.05, red light. That 0.05 is just an arbitrary number that's been reinforced by historical usage. But there is, you, you cannot make a credible intellectual argument that that number should be sacred, should be written in stone. Um, this provides no guidance about what you do when the uh, evidence is inconclusive. And as I've already mentioned, one of the big problems is that it ignores cost. This was one of the most uh, contentious technologies from the point of view of the Medicare program. This is a picture of what's called a left ventricular assist device. It's a form of artificial heart, originally developed to keep people alive who are heart transplant candidates until uh, a donor heart could be found. The company that produced this decided to test it as use uh, as a, uh, an intervention for what they call destination therapy, meaning to treat people with very severe heart failure who are not going to get an, a uh, heart transplant. So obviously, when you're talking about the Medicare population, the number of Medicare beneficiaries who are candidates for heart transplants is relatively low. Um, but there is a huge population of Medicare beneficiaries with severe congestive heart failure. Great business opportunity if this works. And so there is a very well-designed randomized trial published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. They took people, congestive heart failure is normally classified on the systematic, uh, this, this scale called the New York Heart Association scale, which runs from stage one to stage four congestive heart failure. The principal investigator of this trial jokingly said, we just enrolled people with stage five congestive heart failure. Very, very sick people who were in the ICU, by and large, and they were randomized to continue with whatever conventional therapies they were getting or to get the left ventricular assist device. That distance between the survival curves for the LVAD group and for the medical therapy group is statistically significant. I want to point out two things. Um, one is that everybody pretty much in both groups was dead by two years. And the other thing that's not shown here is the cost of treating these people. First of all, most of their time was spent in the hospital, whichever group that they were in. Secondly, uh, the implantation itself with the device was estimated to cost about $80,000. But depending on which series you looked at, the cost of keep, pe keeping these people alive per year was on the order of two hundred fifty dollars to $900,000. It's not that the device costs that much. It's just that it wasn't such a, it wasn't a home run technology in the sense that they returned to normal. They still needed lots and lots of hospital care, very expensive drugs, uh, and they didn't live long. Now, did this meet the evidence criteria for effectiveness? As long as you accept life expectancy as a valid outcome measure, and virtually everybody does, there's no question here. There's a statistically significant improvement in life expectancy. And what's interesting is there was a medical ethicist on the MCAC Medicare Coverage Advisory Committee panel that discussed this who could not bring himself to vote in favor of saying that this uh, technology met the evidence criteria because he was so appalled at the usage of Medicare resources that this represented. And of course, you don't have to look to something quite as dramatic as the artificial heart. Uh, Dana Goldman and I worked many years ago on uh, this, this product. It was actually its predecessor called Serides that made the company. Genzyme uh, it costs somewhere between $200,000 and $500,000 a year, and therapy is lifelong. Avastin has been in the news yesterday, actually, for macular degeneration, where it's a bargain. For those of you who saw the Wall Street Journal article, which said it costs $40 a dose, actually I've been told you could get it for $4 a dose uh, when it's injected in the eyes. But when used for these uh, cancer indications, it costs about $8,000 a month. Uh, Genentech has announced that they will cap people's costs at $65,000 a year. Most people don't live a year, so it's not clear how binding that cap will be from their point of view. Um, but, but in any case, they haven't announced the details of that program, and even at 65000 it's not cheap. Herbitux is about 115000 a year. This is a drug that's used more widely for people who will live a long time, 20000 a year. 
So this is one of the most contentious areas for commercial insurers and also for Medicare, the so-called specialty drugs. They're obviously growing in importance both because they're expensive and because more and more of these products are being introduced. So I want to very quickly say what the solution is as far as I see it. And I'm not going to go through uh, all the details of cost-effectiveness analysis, but this is new ground for the United States and it is very, very well established in Europe, in Australia, and in many other countries where coverage policy is not purely made on the basis of evidence of effectiveness, but it's also made on the basis of cost-effectiveness. So here's just uh, sort of the two-minute version of what cost-effectiveness analysis does. You look at all of the costs that result from using an intervention and you look at the gain in, in health. Uh, so the costs are not, it, when you think about the LVAD, the increase in cost is not just the implantation, it's the cost of keeping the people alive. And then you have some fairly easy decisions. Let's say that you spend more and get less. You don't have to be an economist. In fact, you don't even have to be a basic mathematician to figure out this is not really what you want to do. If you spend less and get more, again, it's a no-brainer. That sounds like a good thing to do. Spend less, get less. We don't really talk about this much, but it's symmetric with this last quadrant. Spend more and get more. And then you ask, is it really worth it? If you have something that costs more and it confers some kind of health benefit. Well, if, obviously, if the costs rise by a lot and you don't get much benefit, that's not very cost effective. If you, uh, on the other hand, costs rise by little, and you get a lot of benefit, that's a good deal. So we usually measure the uh, outcomes in terms of quality adjusted life years. In other words, something like life expectancy adjusted for change in quality of life. And then you look at costs. Now, I want to just give you an example of something that's uh, I, I probably, from the public's point of view, a dead issue, but it's a live one still for physicians. COX-2 inhibitors, think about Vioxx, Celebrex. Before, there was all the uproar about their cardiac effects, and um, before Vioxx was removed from the market, there was already some concern about the cardiac effects, and um, there were some legitimate questions about what role these drugs should play. So the major advantage of a COX-2 is that it reduces GI bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, in people who have any inflammatory condition that might benefit from a non anti-inflammatory drug. So these authors looked at the cost effectiveness of a COX-2 inhibitor compared to a common non naproxen, and in their base case, which is the ordinary, say, rheumatoid arthritis patient, they got a very unfavorable cost effectiveness ratio of nearly $300,000 per life year saved. Um, once they, they had some fairly conservative assumptions about adverse heart effects, Subsequently, you would say the heart effects are much worse. But even with their conservative assumption, as you'd expect, the cost-effectiveness ratio worsened considerably. Obviously, if you can get a good price for the drug, that is good from the point of view of the purchaser, a low price, it looks better. And with VA costs, you, you have considerably better cost-effectiveness ratio. But still, at $142,000 per quality just life year, you wouldn't say this is a good deal. However, Take a high-risk patient, and the physicians here know high-risk patient means somebody who has already had a major GI bleed when taking naproxen, uh, Advil, or another non anti-inflammatory drug. And here, it becomes cost-effective. And I might add that this was the approved indication for the COX-2s. In the first place, if Merck and Pfizer had never marketed outside of that group, there probably never would have been the big scandal. Uh, about the use of the drugs. And, and I have to add that at least my own belief as a physician is Vioxx is still a valuable drug for that kind of person, but it is clearly a bad thing for people who are not at high risk. This is one of the great virtues, to my mind, of using a cost-effectiveness approach to coverage is that you actually shape which kinds of technologies get developed because you, you give the market a signal of what will get reimbursed. And if you look at, this is from a study that Dana Goldman led, and it projects the effects of some near-term horizon treatments on expenditures. 
And Dana and the rest of the group looked at cost effectiveness and they looked at the total implications for Medicare expenditures. And you take, this is the resveratrol case. Resveratrol, as you may know, is this um, compound that's present in red wine. If you drink something like three barrels of wine, red wine a day, you'll live a lot longer. Um, but there actually are companies who are producing purified resveratrol and related compounds to do this effect. And what resveratrol does is mimic the effects of starving without the inconvenient lack of food, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, this is a, a blue sky scenario. The idea, if it works like caloric restriction does, you stay, you stay young, relatively uh, free of ill health, you're usually in a crappy mood, but I mean, apart from that, it's, it's a really good way to go. And, um, and what you see here is so a lot of people would take the drug, so the total expenditure implications are pretty high, but the cost per additional life year is, is very low. Um, now, one problem with this is that I think the assumption about the pricing of such a compound is likely to be wrong. Uh, but anyway, so that's a good scenario, and in a cost-effectiveness-shaped coverage policy, you would see more compounds like this. Now, this particular uh, exercise did include some existing technologies, and here I have the red arrow at LVADs, and this confirms what we saw in the preceding slides, that as LVADs, not that many people would get them, but they cost a lot per patient who gets it, and you've got on the order of a uh, cost effectiveness ratio on the order of a half a million dollars per uh, life year. Not a good deal. In an evidence based coverage world, LVADs get covered. At this pricing, I would contend that unless incomes change dramatically in the upward direction, there's no way in a cost effectiveness based uh, coverage world that this would receive insurance coverage and this technology would never be likely to develop unless its cost came down. So just, I want to summarize with a few uh, comments. There are alternatives that I haven't fully mentioned, and um, people might choose to have uh, tailored coverage that is only cover certain aspects of care um, rather than uh, high coinsurance rates. But the way they might want to have it tailored is say, I want insurance that's going to pay for high value care. Um, the kind of information you develop with a cost-conscious coverage policy is about cost-effectiveness. Consumers who are bearing a lot of the cost out of pocket will have an interest in this like they've never had before. Because now, when they're bearing a significant fraction of the cost themselves, they don't just care about whether it works, they care about what it costs and whether it represents good value. And again, we have plenty of studies showing that consumers are sensitive to price the question is whether they have the information they need to make intelligent decisions. Uh, <clears throat> one of the approaches that politicians love to talk about is reducing reimbursement rates. And that is one way you can lower expenditures. After all, expenditures equals price times quantity. Can't do anything about quantity. Try to do something about price. Uh, last, there, this year, we were, there was a scheduled 5% cut in Medicare payments to providers, which Congress reversed as they've done so many times before. There are limits to what you can do with reimbursement rates. I'm not trying to say you should never attempt to do it, but to think that is going to be the solution for health expenditures, I think, is, um, is just fooling yourself. Uh, furthermore, and I think this is crucial, you've got to look at how, how monopoly products are priced. Until the, uh, the implementation, I think it's this year, of the so-called ASP approach to reimbursement for Medicare Part B drugs, where the Medicare reimbursement is based on a measure of average sales price, the way that the, the pricing was set was the company, the monopolist company, which has a unique product, would go to Medicare and say, okay, we've got the evidence of effectiveness you have to cover, and Medicare really had no choice. And then the company just named the price. There's no negotiation. Medicare is pure and simple a price taker. They had no alternative, and they would pay whatever was asked. Now, they can bring political pressure to bear to mitigate this somewhat, but once you say that we don't need to cover because it's not cost effective, 
and I have to say, this is one way I think NICE in England has not done such a great job. You can just say, I won't cover because it's not cost effective. Well, step two, presumably, will be some negotiation over price to make it cost effective. The way NICE works in England, there is no step two. If it's not cost effective, it's not covered, end of story. Uh, there's no second round with price revision. So it can change the demand for these products in ways that ultimately reduce uh, prices. I'm not going to pretend that coverage policy is the only answer and is the, uh, the absolute crucial part. Um, and there are some alternatives. Reference pricing, where uh, a payer says, we'll just pay for the lowest price drug in a class and you pay for the difference out of pocket, can provide a lot of the same benefits. And Mike Chernu, who Roger mentioned earlier, uh, has been pushing benefit-based co-payments. And there the idea is that uh, we'll be smart about the cost sharing. We could even subsidize the purchase of certain things. Say uh, an overweight hypertensive, you might pay them to take their blood pressure pills rather than using our typical three or four tiered drug formula right now where you have a $10 co-payment if it's generic. Sometimes it actually pays to bribe people to take their medicines. And this was proposed many years ago by Mark Pauley in a paper called um, Benign Moral Hazard. But this kind of approach, I would contend, should have a role. But once you look at what's been done, you see how difficult benefit-based co-payments are to implement. Uh, and that's something we could discuss further. I'm a big fan of this approach, but I also think it has limits. Uh, so the bottom line here, what I'm proposing is coverage needs to be based on cost effectiveness as well as evidence of effectiveness. My own ideal health insurance uh, reform scheme would include plenty of plan choice, but if you want a plan that's going to pay for stuff that's not cost effective, you have to pay for the additional cost yourself without a tax subsidy. Um, one of the most difficult issues for physicians and for policymakers alike is that if you really want to tackle high costs, you're going to have to give up some treatments that might provide some benefit at the end of life or for people with very severe illnesses simply because they're too expensive for the value that they provide. Uh, a little plug here, um, Gail Walensky has been arguing for something similar. There have been many proposals over the years. You can't do this without some kind of uh, agency or entity that can provide the information you need to make the decisions about what's effective and what's cost effective. There's a public good issue. The private sector is not going to provide this on its own. The only people who would pay for it are people who have a vested interest, and the information any such entity would produce would reflect that interest. Um, but I want to add that don't think of this only as a way to deal with expenditures today. This is a mechanism for shaping technological innovation uh, and to redirect it toward high value goods and services rather than those who provide minimal benefit at very high cost. Thank you. I have a, I have a question. Um, so thank you for an informative presentation. Um, I guess more on this issue of the vested interest thing. Um, so the influence or infiltration of drug companies, um, and when they conduct these randomized trials, it just so happens it seems like, like there was a recent article in the New England Journal on the sepsis drug that was, I think it's like $8,000 um, for this one treatment, and it just so happens that the drug company that I'm not going to name um, sponsor this research, and then they, they were the ones who established this guideline of this is the best care you can provide. So how do you, I know it's a fine line between having money to fund these kind of research studies, but how do you get them with vested interests out of establishing policy for what is evidence-based best care? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't criticize the drug companies because they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. But the, what I see as the main problem is not that the drug companies are intervening, but they're entering a vacuum that is not being filled by objective sources of information. My guess is that industry-funded studies that do not meet high-quality criteria would have very little influence if there was a more objective alternative available. And that's why I'm proposing putting more money into this. Basically, I haven't told you how much, but it's a large, large figure, so that there can be at least a fair referee. I think in the future, uh, 
the drug company funded studies are still going to be a very important source of information, but they shouldn't be the only source of information. And the interposition into the guidelines process is a, uh, is a big issue, uh, obviously because they have vested interests, but if there are competing guidelines produced by truly objective entities, I don't think people would pay attention to the drug company funded guidelines. Mark? Alan, uh, Mark Silverstein from Methodist Hospital. Alan, that's terrific, and um, I'd like to pursue some of the implications if we ever get to the stage where we have cost-conscious coverage decisions. Um, one uh, issue has to do with it. taking each study uh, by itself, well done, unbiased, uh, and representing the best possible evidence. We would have some thresholds, whether it's arbitrary and whether it's it's 50,000 or 100,000, whatever is the metric. But uh, individual technologies, devices, and drugs would meet that threshold and then presumably would be covered. But the other part of the sort of decision rule is until we've run out of money and we have fixed budgets, and then we don't reassess and withdraw coverage or change those, those uh, values. So what usually happens in this environment, of course, is we, we get the study, we meet some threshold, we quote, get coverage, and then we've got you know, uh, our fixed budget or we've got our budgets uh, uh, already taken up by the expensive technologies and the new ones you know, can't come in unless we have more money, which I don't know where we're going, it's going to come from. So uh, we're, the next question is if we actually get serious about cost conscious coverage decisions, we're going to have to start thinking about where we set those thresholds and what do we do as new technologies try to come in. And that might mean either withdrawing coverage from previous or replacing technologies or making some hard decisions. Yeah, Mark, you're making an excellent point. And um, I want to just mention one thing that I didn't say explicitly, I guess, which is that I don't think different people are going to be happy with the same cost effectiveness threshold. Some people are going to want more extensive and expensive care. And what we do in public programs is likely to be different from what happens in commercial programs. And to anybody who says we need one level of care for everybody in the US, I think that's a good ideal. It has never happened here, and it doesn't happen in the rest of the world either, even in uh, countries that have predominantly government-funded insurance. And uh, Vivian's nodding her head because she's lived in one of those systems. Uh, so there's almost always some kind of private outlet. Uh, and you could see where this might be explicit, where you choose a health plan if you have a taste for more care that's going to provide you more and have a less restrictive um, set of choices, basically. Uh, but you are absolutely right, in particular, about the issue of existing treatments, existing technologies. Uh, David Eddy has said, and there's not really a strong basis for this, but Everybody has figured that only about 15% of what the care we provide has ever been properly studied. If we had the money to do it, we would start studying some of the existing approaches to care much more systematically, and I think that it's bound to happen. It's just for a variety of reasons right now, it's much easier to test new stuff as it comes online, not to go back and look at old stuff. But I have to add that usually the new intervention is being compared to something existing, and if the new intervention wins, it means the old intervention has gotten a negative vote. And very often, when you have a major innovation, the old approaches disappear. But as you're, you basically said, we don't have any systematic way of studying the old uh, interventions, and that absolutely should be studied. Okay, um, I, I have a question in regards to the cost effectiveness um, with the insurance company you know, tr deciding whether they're gonna pay out for different procedures or not. Uh, and in, in light of, uh, there's a, a, a good number, good percentage of the medical expenses that apparently are paid in the last year of life, was wondering if, if you have ever thought about the ethical and, and legal ramifications of the insurance company making a, the medical insurance company making a deal with the uh, patient to simply pay a percentage of the expected medical cost as a death benefit. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it as percentage. In other words, in, instead of saying, well, you know, th this treatment's going to cost us potentially $300,000 or whatever, we will pay you upon your death $150,000. <laughs> well, people are laughing, but it's not really a bad idea. And in fact, when you reach Medicare age, 
you get an entitlement to health care that is worth, I'm not sure what the right figure would be in present value terms, probably around 100000 something like that, maybe more. And the question is, if you could take that as a lump sum, would you put all of it into health care that's compensated, that's paid for by Medicare, or would you choose to spend some of that on housing, some long-term care, which is barely covered uh, by Medicare? So it's a fair question. But that's uh, an area where wise men dare not tread. <laughs> Alan, you may want to revoke my PhD after you hear this question. Um, get, one, people can make the argument that every time the general level of health care costs increases, that we price someone out of the market and they're not able to afford health insurance because of that. Um, could we have a policy where um, Medicare will only uh, increase the new technologies uh, that it will c agree to cover in a year in correspondence to the rate of increase of GDP in the country. Well, what you're always saying is, can you cap Medicare's budget at some percentage over GDP? And if you look at the tools Medicare has to keep its budget under control, it, they're very, very limited. So basically I'm saying, unless you change the rules under which Medicare operates, that's not possible to do what you just described. Now, if you look at Japan, which also has a predominantly fee-for-service insurance system, when volume goes up, they have a kind of automatic ratcheting down of the re unit reimbursement rate. So that's how they try to um, capture that. Uh, you don't really have that kind of flexibility in Medicare because Congress, as I mentioned before, let this override a scheduled uh, reimbursement cut. So definitely this could be done under a different set of rules, but it would not be Medicare as we know it. Which rules are you referring to? Uh, the one that requires the physician reimbursement rate on January 1st to go down by 5.4%. Haven't they rescinded that the last yeah. two years? That's the controlled growth? Talk to your congressman or woman. <laughs> Um, yeah, but again, you're, taught, you're imagining a different world than the one we currently live in. I mean, seriously, the, the med school deans don't quake in their boots when they hear about these scheduled cuts because they know they've been able to reverse them. Now, I think next year is going to be very interesting because the pressure on Congress is much greater to, to implement the cuts. So, in theory, yes, but you have to think of what's the political configuration that would change in a way to enable this to happen. So it, it's not that it couldn't be done uh, in principle, but just the way the politics work out, it hasn't happened. Delicious topic. Um, <laughs> Rich Johnson with the Texas Medical Association. Uh, our members, uh, physicians tell us and their pa the patients they talk with that a lot of the information about metrics to make judgments about cost and quality affordability are confusing in the sense that some of the metric systems say if your cost is X, you can't be in our tiered network that's based primarily on the cost of an, a typical episode. Some of the others deal with if you, if you do this performance measure and this one and this one, you're more likely to be a quote unquote quality doctor. Uh, What's your comment about how we try to explain that difference to policymakers and to patients, too, who are trying to use the information to make good purchasing decisions? Well, that's a great question. I'll try to, I can't do it justice in the time I have, but let me just make a, couple, a few observations. Medicare is a more traditional fee for service system than you can find in probably any other segment of the U.S. healthcare system. And we're trying to add on management controls, pay for performance, change incentives. It is incredibly difficult. It is a system that was never designed for this purpose. And it's understandable that you can't get things right, especially at the beginning when you implement some of these programs like pay for performance. And um, in fairness to CMS, I have to say not every physician group has been supportive of the effort. The AMA comes to mind. Uh, and on top of that, the physicians do have legitimate complaints 
I, most policymakers, I think, would say if we were to design the system from the ground up, we wouldn't preserve fee-for-service Medicare uh, in its current form. Now, that's not probably what your members want to hear, no, no. but it does not lend itself to these kinds of management controls. And I think that's one of the fundamental challenges. Can you preserve this choice, this fee-for-service structure, while putting in some modern utilization controls and, and quality performance incentives? And um, it's going to be tough. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of patience on the part of providers. Yeah, well, well, briefly, as long as physicians are, work in, as individuals, small groups, small clinics, and hospitals are small scale, you'll never get to the point where you can have reliable outcome measures of performance because there's too much noise relative to the signal of performance. So um, we're going to be stuck in those situations with primarily process measures with all of their imperfections. But it may be that if there's more uh, larger performance incentives, we're going to have a migration toward larger group practices that can more readily implement these kinds of quality improving activities. Thank you for your We had originally scheduled a break at this time, but if you, would, um, if you would go along with us, what we decided to do is to move right into the next speaker because um, we, we sort of thought about things in, in Houston uh, early Friday afternoon rush hour traffic and we want to make sure our speakers get to the airport in time. Uh, I know they're happy to be here in Houston, but I don't think they want to spend the night. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to our final speaker, uh, who is David Cutler. And uh, David Cutler is a chaired professor in the Department of Economics at Harvard University, and he's also the Dean for Social Sciences uh, at Harvard. And uh, you can read his impressive list of accomplishments uh, in, in the agenda that you have before you. But I'll also say this, David and I finished our PhDs at the same time, so we uh, graduated uh, for graduate school at the same time, but I consider him, as well as Alan, a mentor because he is one of the, uh, the, the, um, the people in the health economics profession who is absolutely wonderful in terms of giving constructive comments on other people's research and has really improved, uh, really worked to sort of boost the, the level of the literature for the entire field, and for that many people are grateful. So with that, we'll move on to uh, David's presentation, which is the value equation in healthcare. Thank you. Um, it's rare that people say nice things about economists from Harvard. <laughs> Maybe you have, you have to get out, get out for a bit. Um, uh, it's always dangerous to be the last speaker before sangria time. So um, I thought I, I, I have this, this so inspiringly um, uh, informative title that I thought I would start off with a quiz. So, uh, so let me see, how do I advance to the quiz? So one of the following um, three statements is true, and I'm going to show you the statements, and then I'm going to have you uh, vote on which, which of the three is, uh, is true. So here's the first one. Money spent on new medical innovation is a major drain on the economy. How many agree that that's true? I see the second two. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is not an evidence-based based, <laughs> based quiz. How many agree that this is true? Raise your hands if you agree. How many disagree? Okay. More R&D will lower health spending. How many agree that this is true? How many disagree? So you all obviously, along with me, vote for number three. <laughs> Elvis is alive and hunting the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, what I want to tell you about today, uh, as I say, one of these is true, and I'm going to argue that the first two are not. Um, and uh, I will take no stand, uh, no stand on what ghosts are, are, uh, are, are, are up uh, 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 in Boston these days. I want to talk a bit about um, innovation in um, medical care, what's good and what's bad about it, and ways to think about it. In many ways, I'm going to take off from what Alan did. Um, so he set up the issue um, 
perfectly for me. And I want to st start off just um, with an observation. If you wake up your typical um, health policymaker at uh, 2 in the morning and you say, what are the issues in US healthcare? They would say, well, there are three of them, access, cost, and quality. And I actually want to suggest that's not quite right. And Alan really uh, got at this in his presentation. The real issues are access, um, getting everybody into the system, and value. And that's really what cost and quality are about. Spending money isn't bad. Spending money when you, don't, when you shouldn't be spending money um, isn't is bad and conversely not spending money when you should be spending it is bad as well And so the what I want to deal with are sort of the successes Where do we spend money where it's good to spend money and the failures of which there are two varieties overdoing it? Which is what Alan spoke a fair amount about and then underdoing it um, Things that we ought to get that we don't and, and uh, Dana Goldman I think spoke a little bit about that this morning <coughs> And so um, just to give you the summary in case you decide that um, it's a martini time a little bit earlier. Um, I'm going to tell you that actually on average we get a lot for our spending, that even though there's a fair amount, there's, there's quite a lot of money that's put in over time, um, what we've gotten in terms of our health has been enormously beneficial. But that doesn't mean that we get everything right, and particularly if you think about marginal changes, there are enormously good things we can do, both by not doing some things and by doing um, some, more, some more of other things. And the, the, the key I'm going to talk about is money. Um, with an economist, there's no... Um, it's obvious why I talk about um, money. I'm reminded a little bit of what um, Bob Solow, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, once said about Milton Friedman, the late Nobel Prize winning economist. He said, all Milton Friedman ever thinks about is the money supply, which is true, that is all Milton Friedman ever used to think about. All I think about, uh, Bob Solow went on, all I think about is sex, but I don't let it get into my writing. Uh, so um, I will think a little bit about the money supply. Um, in healthcare. And I want to do it uh, slightly um, historically and um, really pick up from one of Alan's charts and say, uh, talk about the rise of modern medicine and why do we spend more on medical care. And fundamentally, in, in any market, healthcare or groceries or uh, cars, if we spent more this year than last year, it's either because we paid more for the same thing or we got more things. There are only two reasons why, why you spend more. Leave aside the issue of what happens if the tomatoes got higher quality. Is that a price increase or a quantity increase? I'm going to leave that aside for a second. Um, the answer in healthcare is that we spend more because we can do um, so much more. And so I want to give you an example which will come through, uh, which, which I'm, I'm going to follow up some, and that has to do with cardiovascular disease. Any, uh, where's, the, uh, where, where's Rich? Is that the head of the uh, Texas Medical Association? How would you treat a heart attack in 1950? Well, since I'm not a cardiologist, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Any cardiologists in the audience? Physicians? Bed rest. Bed rest. President Eisenhower had a heart attack. He was in Denver. Um, it was misdiagnosed, actually. His doctor thought he had indigestion, sent him back to bed. Woke up uh, 10 hours later, still in pain. They said, hmm, maybe we ought to take him to the hospital. And they prescribed bed rest, which actually turns out to be very cheap. I mean, he, he had a whole wing of a hospital, so it wasn't nearly as cheap. But the key point is that was not a lot of money was spent on, um, uh, on, on, uh, on, on caring for, um, uh, for, for anyone with, um, uh, with, with a heart attack. Um, today, there are all sorts of things that happen. There are various pharmaceuticals and intensive stuff and therapeutic stuff. Dick Cheney has had everything on the right-hand side a few times. Um, the average person who is 45 years old will spend $30,000 on cardiovascular disease care over their remaining life. Why do we spend more? Because we can do um, so much more. And then the question is, well, is it worth it? And in order to say whether it's worth it, you have to talk about the outcomes. Okay. So there are a couple of different outcomes. There's mortality and, and uh, quality of life would be the biggest ones. There are other things like if you treat someone's heart attack, do you make them be productive enough so they can go back to work? And so, But these are basically elderly people, and actually the financial implications for us of treating heart attacks in the elderly population are negative because people live longer and collect more benefits. But that, that's substantially less important than this. This is uh, cardiovascular disease mortality over time. It's fallen by... Um, over 50% in the past half century, since we've gone from bed rest to um, treating people much better. Life expectancy at age 45 has increased by four and a half years. Probably about two-thirds of that is a result of medical care. 
both the intensive stuff that you do after a heart attack and the uh, preventive stuff you do through medications. So I would say about three years as a result of that. Um, and then the remaining one third is, is most predominantly a result of reduced smoking. Uh, so three years uh, is what the typical 45 year old has, has gotten. And the, you will, you will want to know about the quality. And so I'm here to tell you that the quality tends to be pretty good. So this chart shows you what share of elderly people have impairments in their ability to kind of conduct themselves on a daily basis, cooking, cleaning, you know, all the things my wife has concluded I'm impaired by. Um, and the share of elderly people with that impairment, with those impairments has been declining about one to one and a half percent a year. Um, if anything, actually a little bit at an increasing rate in different years. This isn't all from cardiovascular disease. A fair part of this would be from things like arthritis and um, uh, other uh, chronic diseases. But, it, but the same is true about people who have um, had some kind of cardiovascular disease incident. Okay, um, so for the think, come back to the 45 year old. I've given you two pieces of evidence. One is that he or she spends $30,000 more on caring for cardiovascular disease, and the second is that they will live three years longer. You know what question I'm going to ask you. Is it worth it? How many say yes? How many say no? Well, what you've all told me is that you actually don't think the U.S. is spending too much money on medical care. In fact, you kind of think the U.S. is not spending enough money on medical care. That is, we should buy three of these. Um, Alan spoke a little bit about how people value health. A typical number would be something like $100,000 for a year of life, a typical economic number that people get out of sort of studies about how much people are willing to pay for safety devices. If you plug that number in, that $30,000 of spending turns into about $120,000 of benefits for the typical person, or $4 out for every dollar in. That's not a rate of return of 4%. That's a rate of return of 300%. Maybe your banks are better in Texas than they are in Massachusetts, but we don't have a lot of options for 300% rates of return. In fact, if you look across the medical sector as a whole, what you see is that in almost every case that we've been able to do it, the value of spending more has been significantly greater than the cost of doing so. So over time, we have put a lot of money into stuff. And by and large, the exception has been the high end, the high cost things that Alan went through. And the rule has been more of the low cost things. That is, the benefits of the vast bulk of what we do. Cancer is a very obvious exception. It's interesting that a lot of Alan's examples about new things that are going to pose particular problems are in the realm of cancer, where it's likely not to get better very much in the near-term future. But <coughs> um, if you just say, given everything that we've done, was it better to have done it or not to have done it, in light of the fact that we spend five times more as a share of GDP than we used to on healthcare, the answer is absolutely yes. The thing that I find that's striking about all of this is people value their health very highly. So if you say to people, you're getting richer, what do you want to spend your money on? People will say, I want to live a longer, healthier life. Let me ask you a different question. Suppose I tell you you can have one of the following two things. You can have either all the health improvements that have happened since 1950, the longer life, the higher quality life, or you can have all the consumption gains that have happened since 1950 the computers, the better automobiles, the TVs, the radios, the nicer appliances, everything. You can have one of those two. How many would choose the health gains? How many would choose the consumption gains? It's about equal in this room. How many find it hard to know which one is better? The implication of finding it hard to know is that you think that the value of health improvement has been roughly equal to the value of everything else that we've done in society over that time. Or to say it another way, GDP understates by 50% what has been the real growth in living standards. Now, healthcare has not expanded by as much as GDP has, which means that, in fact, this has been a more productive than most industry, not a less productive than most industry. And where that's showing up is people saying, as I get to be rich, um, that's what I want. So the first basic fact about healthcare that I try and keep in mind when I think about the value proposition 
is that yes, we spend a ton of money, but that when you actually try and analyze what you're getting for it, it really looks like it's worth it. The real issue is not figuring out how to spend less. The real issue is figuring out where we're wasting money that we shouldn't be. And I think there are actually two different kinds of waste. They, they're both, this is my very sophisticated economic theory. I've divided, don't worry if you can't understand it. I, uh, you, know, you, you might have to be in the economics department to, under, to, to truly make sense of all this. <coughs> so I've grouped all of medical care by whether it should be done and whether it is done. And by should be done, I'm going to assign Alan Garber to decide whether it's cost effective or not. And whether it is done is a statement about whether people actually wind up receiving the care. And the good, there, there are a couple of good scenarios. One is up here, this is care that should be done that is done. Increasingly, we develop more ways to treat people. So for example, the heart attacks, we, 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 you know, we, in principle, if we'd known how to do bypass surgery for President Eisenhower, we should have done it. Um, but we didn't wind up doing it. So we create the opportunity to put more in this box and we wind up doing it. And also down here, stuff that we shouldn't do that, that winds, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that stuff that we shouldn't do that we don't do. Like, for example, do bypass surgery on Alan Garber this afternoon. Um, both of those are good things. The bad things are here and here. This is the overused care. That's what Alan was talking about. These are the people who shouldn't get services but do get services. These might be the million dollar um, uh, new drug or the $500,000 LVAD. Um, and these are the things that I think Dana Goldman was talking a little bit about. These are the things that people should get that they don't get. And I, I, I'll actually, I actually want to give you a little bit of example of that, but think about pe diabetics who should be better managed than they are, of which that's about 60 to 70% of all diabetics, or people with hypertension who should be better managed, about 75% of all hypertensives. I want to illustrate this box and this box with a couple of examples. And the examples are going to show you why it is that I think money is so important here. What led to all of this, as Roger Feldman was pointing out, was money. That is, we paid for this stuff, and so people got the stuff. And in many cases, that was good. What's going on here is, I fear, equally um, an example of money, um, sometimes bad. So let me give you two examples of that. The first is Vioxx. Alan um, brought up the issue of Vioxx. It was marketed aggressively, perhaps too much so to physicians and patients. Um, there were suggestions that cardiovascular disease problems were not um, acted upon quickly enough, although that's obviously a subject of some litigation. Um, thousands of people died before the drug was withdrawn. Merck is in um, enormous difficulties about Vioxx. Vioxx is an example of something that for a lot of patients, um, as Alan showed you, shouldn't have been done but was done. Why was it done? Because there were enormous profits to doing so. Okay. <coughs> Merck makes... Um, probably about two to three dollars a pill for every Vioxx pill that it sold. The cost of producing each pill, once, it's, once you've discovered the drug, the cost of producing each pill and getting it to a patient is probably about 15 or 20 cents. So when you make a pill for 15 cents and you sell it for two and a half bucks, there's a lot of incentive to get people to take it. And so there was a lot of money putting into, put into getting people to, um, to take it. And so that's... Um, uh, what's going on down there, and of course there were no incentives the other way, so we wind up uh, we wind up doing too much of it. So that's one side one side of the coin. The other side is, I think, actually even more troubling. Many of you know um, that you should be taking an aspirin to reduce the risk of heart disease. Okay, a couple times a week, take an take an aspirin, low dose aspirin. I want to ask the question: When should you have first known that? The FDA um, approved aspirin as a primary prevention for heart attacks in 1998. When should you have known that? Way before then. The first studies in the medical literature that suggested that aspirin were, was likely effective in preventing heart disease, severe heart incidents, was 1948. Dr. Lawrence Craven noted that 400 men who took, none of the 400 men who took aspirin had heart attacks. He recommended an aspirin a day. Studies dwindled out over the next few years. In 1980, aspirin was approved for prevention of strokes in people who have had uh, kind of mini strokes, transient ischemic attacks. In 1985, the FDA approved aspirin as a secondary prevention for heart attacks, once you've had one, to prevent another. And in 1998, it finally got around to approving aspirin as primary prevention. Why did it take 50 years? 
Aspirin was off patent. So if you come back here, aspirin is the poster child for a long time of stuff down here, stuff that should have been done but wasn't, and because there was no money in it. So aspirin, if it cost 15 cents to produce, sold at roughly 15 cents. So as a result, nobody was out there trying to push strongly the idea that we ought to be um, giving, getting everyone to take an aspirin. In fact, when the money flows um, are strong, we get a lot of this upper row. When the money flows are weak, we get a lot of this lower row. Sometimes that's good. Oftentimes that's bad. And the biggest problems in the medical system have to do when money doesn't line up with what should happen. So to me, as I look at this, um, I see the good and the bad as both illustrating the role of um, money. When there's a strong financial incentive, uh, you get lots of marketing rapid production, which may be good or bad. In many cases, it's good. In some cases, it's bad. When there are weak financial incentives, people don't have an interest in making it happen, um, and that may be good or bad. Or if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Um, so that leads me then to the value proposition. Money is the opposite of the weather. Nobody talks about it, but everybody does something about it. And so I want to think about how you can use money flows to reorient what goes on in the medical system. And I want to think about three different types of money flows. And these have sort of been discussed earlier, so I won't go into them in so much detail, but I wanted to kind of bring, try and bring them together a little bit. One is performance-based payment, which is really an analogy to some of the things that Alan was talking about, although a little bit less than the zero-one decision. Second is, is information technology and, um, uh, and the mon monetary issues there. And then third is sensible cost sharing, which has come up a couple of times. To my mind, probably the most important reform we can make is not just to reimburse um, better, not just to reimburse more care, but to reimburse better quality care um, over lower quality care. So that would tell the physicians, look, if you find a way to reduce heart attack incidents in your population, then you'll get paid more. And of course, that'll create a pretty strong incentive to figure out whether things like aspirin really should be given and how to make sure that your patients are actually taking aspirin. Um, and conversely, once we determine that Vioxx isn't really so cost effective in some patients, even before we know about the heart disease stuff, just say, look, we're not going to cover Vioxx as well. We're not going to pay physicians as, as much for doing something that's not so um, cost effective. Someone mentioned the opportunity, I think the kind of um, one of the opportunities here, which is Medicare is currently, Medicare is this thing called the sustainable growth rate, which is when volume goes up, they're supposed to cut fees, or as I uh, call it in my mind, the unsustainable growth rate. That um, since volume has gone up so much, Medicare fees are supposed to fall by 25%. Well, it's obvious that we're not going to pay doctors 25% less, or else pretty soon they'll be paying us to see Medicare patients. Um, but rather than just kind of in the dead of night every year, sort of rescinding it, why don't we say, look, we're going to do something sensible for it and say, we'll pay the 5% more, the 10% more, over time, the 25% more, but we're not going to pay it across the board. We're going to pay it to folks who are doing good stuff and not to folks who are not doing, who, who are not doing the good stuff. The other way some of this can happen is regionally. Um, there's no, uh, it, it, it would be hard, but there's no obvious reason why the insurers and the providers in the greater Houston area couldn't come together and say, you know what, it's stupid for us to pay um, a hospital once to take out someone's gallbladder and a second time to deal with the infection that resulted from the fact that the gallbladder wasn't taken out the right way. Why don't we, uh, why don't we all get together and decide that we're going to do things differently around here and we're not going to pay for things like that? Or we're going to pay more for primary care doctors who do a better job of treating their um, diabetic patients and we're all going to agree that that's an important thing and that'll happen. There are a few antitrust issues along the way. Um, I'm not going to uh, worry about those as long as I don't get arrested. Um, so I think I, either regionally or through Medicare, there are ways of dealing with the, with the money issue. You know, there's so much money there, so much money sloshing around that in principle one can do um, a lot of good stuff. And so that's my first area. The second area is um, information technology. I don't think one is going to do very much in the way of making healthcare be better until we know more. Healthcare is the most information intensive industry in the economy, the most information intensive industry in the economy, and it uses information technology the least of any industry. It still befuddles me that my medical records are on paper, that uh, whenever I go to the doctor three weeks after a test, he or she doesn't have the test results, that 3% um, of doctors, I think it's now 4% of doctors, regularly communicate by email with their patients, which is smaller than the share of priests who regularly communicate with their <laughs> parishioners by patient, by email, and it's probably smaller than the number of people who communicate with the Lord by email. <laughs> um, 
any form of decision support, one still hears doctors say, um, well, I'm doing it this way because that's the experience that I've had with my patients, which might number about 20, and in the US might number about 20 million. You kind of wonder why an experience with 20 is better than an experience with 20 million, except nobody can figure out the experience with 20 million because we don't capture it anywhere. So there's an enormous opportunity here. The big issue is money, as we say um, in um, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't. I won't. I was going to make a joke about taxes, but never mind. Um, just reinforce stereotypes about Massachusetts. Um, it would probably cost about 10% of medical spending, or roughly 2% of spending for five years, um, to uh, wire the medical sector. To me, it is mind-boggling that the federal government has never decided to do this. Um, all the providers, when you ask them, the rich ones say, yeah, we're doing it, and the poor ones say, we can't afford to do it. And of course, they can't afford to do it, because as we keep cutting their fees, the, the margins go lower and lower. So again, if you're thinking about what do we do rather than just give in and say, look, we're going to pay 25% higher fees, why not condition some of that on use of information technology, or even better, just give it to people. Just say, look, we're going, we're going to give it under, under, some, under some conditions. Um, I, a side benefit of this is that once we have all this, we'll actually be able to monitor things like avian flu. Um, to a first approximation, we will not know that avian flu has hit the US until we see massive numbers of people by um, anecdote showing up. And, and it would be a little bit nicer to actually know, you know, gee, why are we seeing all these claims for, for, for something before, um, before it happens by anecdote? So that's, um, that's a, a second part, is information technology. And then the third part has to do with sensible cost sharing. Um, in the Medicare drug benefit that we just passed a couple of years ago, we vary cost sharing by most everything except how valuable the drug is. You know, we vary it by how much the patient has spent already and by the type of, uh, you know, whether it's a branded drug or a generic drug or whatever it is. But no one ever thought to actually say, well, look, if the drug is really beneficial, maybe patients shouldn't pay so much for it. Whereas if the drug is actually quite marginal for the condition that it's being treated, maybe the patient should pay a little bit more. People here know about the donut hole, right? You get covered for a bit, then suddenly they forgot, they ran out of money and they couldn't cover you and then you get covered again. We will ultimately fill that in. There's no, there's no question about that. The real issue is when we, um, uh, when we fill that in, why don't we do something that looks a little bit more sensible? So for example, Dana's written papers and others have written papers that some kind of medications like say an ACE inhibitor for a diabetic patient may both extend life and lower costs. Not clear to me why we charge the same amount for that as we do for Vioxx in the patient who, who didn't really need it. So a, a more sensible policy would change what the patients pay to monitor it. And one of the things that I'm very scared about is we are sort of running at twin cylinders at, at, at full speed along two margins in healthcare reform. One, which is what Roger Feldman spoke about, is to make patients pay more. The other, which is a little bit of what Alan Garber spoke about and others spoke about, which is to per, pay doctors to do the right things. And we're going to find that those are in conflict. That is, we're going to be paying doctors to make sure that their patients take medications. And we're going to be charging patients an enormous amount of money to take those medications. And we haven't quite thought about what's going to happen when those two come together. And the doctor says, you need to take it because I'm paid for it. And the patient says, but I don't want to take it because I'm paying for it. And if you think that that's not going to be a problem, think about managed care, where the patients were very well insured. And so they said, doctor, I want to provide the service. I want you to provide the service. And the doctor said, well, I'd like to do it, but I'm not paid for it, so I can't. And it was exactly the reverse problem, and everybody hated it. So I don't, think, I don't see why we're going to like it much better the other way around. So, I, so, so, the, so, the, so the, the demand side and the supply side do have to go, go together on this. Those are the three things that I think about, the, the provider-based payment, the information technology, and then the cost sharing. And I will just leave you with this observation, which is, given what we know about medical care, maybe with the right um, doctor, Elvis could beat the Yankees um, uh, uh, one more time. I want to stop here and uh, and open it up for comments and questions. Thank you.
Um, Texas has a has pos Texas and California possibly have the biggest problems of any of any states in this in this regard. Um, what, here's what I t here's what I tell here's what I tell um, my students. So if you go back, I said there are basically two issues in healthcare. There's access and there's um, and there's value. Access one is actually very easy to solve as a technical matter. Designing ways to get everybody insurance would not be hard. You can, but what the only difficulty is they're politically hard because someone has to pay more money. Okay. So, so you have to either not give someone a tax cut that they thought they were entitled to or you have to raise taxes on somebody. In fact, the unfortunate thing about covering everybody is that the uninsured won't use that many more medical services when they're insured. Thankfully, they get some of them. So the net increase in spending in the medical system is not all that high. It may be 5%. But the government has to pay a fortune because there are lots of people like the uninsured in the same incomes who are already insured. And you can't go subsidizing those who are, already, who are currently uninsured without providing an equivalent subsidy to those who are already insured because the groups are very fluid. So the cost to the government of doing any kind of real serious universal insurance coverage plan would be $100 billion a year. It's not technically hard. I can come up with 12 ways to do it. I can't come up with any ways that cost less than $70 billion a year. And so that's the, to me, that's the fundamental issue. And it sort of brings up what you say. We're never going to solve the access problem unless we're willing to have the government be more involved in a more redistributive way. The hard one technically and the easy one politically is the value issue. There's not a single politician who won't stand up and say, I believe we ought to improve the value of American medical care. The single hardest thing is, you know, you get six experts in a day and you get six different opinions about how to do it. And the truth be told, if, you, if, if we were all honest, not all of us would say we're not really exactly sure what would happen if we did things our way. We sort of think and we hope and we have models and so on, but, but the truth, but truth be told, we don't. No, just, just, but just to give you a sense about how it played out in Massachusetts, Massachusetts did kind of pass a thing that will guarantee everyone coverage. And then you say, well, where did the money come from? And actually came from, came from three sources. One is it's a tax on poor people. That is, we're requiring people to contribute to their own insurance. Some of that is people who are free riding, and we think it's perfectly fine. Some of that is people who may be paying more than some people will want to pay. But So that's one big source of money. A second big source of money is there was money that was kind of sloshing around in the state. You know, the state was giving money to hospitals that were taking care of uninsured people, and the state was paying extra rates here and there and so on and so forth. And so if you concentrate all that money, you say, well, with no more uninsured people, we don't have to have that money going to the pool for uninsured people and all of that sort of stuff. That gives you a second pot of money. And then the third pot of money was money that Massachusetts had stolen from the federal government that the federal government wanted back. And Massachusetts said, well, how about if we use it to increase coverage? And the federal government said, well, okay, if you use it to increase coverage rather than the stuff you were doing for it, you can keep it. And then there's a very small assessment on business, and there's no direct increase in income taxes for higher income folks. So even in Massachusetts, it was sort of toxic to go to the people who really have the money and say that you want them to put up the money. Um, Massachusetts could do it with those amounts of money, partly because it had stolen a fair amount from the federal government, partly because there was enough sloshing around, partly because there aren't very many uninsured people in Massachusetts, and their incomes tend to be pretty high. <laughs> If you propose something like that in Texas, boy, would it be a problem. And you'd get to the kind of Schwarzenegger issue where, well, if you're going to do it, you better have something like a 6% employer tax built in, plus a pretty big assessment on people, plus a policy that's really catastrophic, plus you better hope that you're really going to steal a lot more money from the federal government. And then you sort of cobble it all together that way. It's kind of the absence of what you do if you don't feel like you can go after it. One of the interesting things in this coming political campaign is everyone's going to be in favor of universal insurance coverage, at least most of the major candidates will. But how many are going to be willing to say something painful about how they're going, how they're going to pay for it? But that's all the coverage thing is. It's very painful. The much harder one, technically, is how do you improve the quality of care? And that's, that's a, that, so that, that's partly why you're sort of seeing people focus on that more than the coverage, which is just a kind of 
mind-numbingly boring discussion if, if you hate politics. Mark Silverstein from the Methodist Hospital. I uh, enjoyed your talk immensely. It's a pleasure to hear complicated things uh, made uh, simple enough that we can understand. My, my mistake, if you could understand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me parenthetically say, my, well, my accent gives me away, but having grown up in Massachusetts, I'm currently licensed in Massachusetts and Texas, but I live and work in Texas. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, patients or doctors, uh, they, they do their best uh, when they encounter one other in the office or in the hospital. And uh, part of the process is to uh, do our best with our available resources. So we may have surgery and put in devices, and we may uh, see our patients and prescribe. And when it comes down to it, I mean, we can do that and we can counsel, and there are a few other things we can do. Um, however, the devices we implant come from a, a market which makes them very effective and expensive, and the drugs are effective. And so would the patient with... Uh, an indication for an expensive drug. We can just do our best. We don't set the price, nor really can the patient. And the healthcare system has to get the drugs and the devices from the, from the market. So yes, we might say we should charge them, but in fact, the, the people who produce the devices and the drugs set the prices for somebody to purchase. So I wonder if you might comment on the, on that aspect. Um, yeah, it's. Um you know, there's there's an issue, and it came up a bit earlier about who who's really in charge of what, and what you, what can you make them responsible for, and the physician. You know, you want to make him or her responsible for doing the right thing for the patient. That's not going to involve lowering the price of the medication. I think if you need to deal with that, you're going to do that in other ways. For better or worse, the way that we we mostly do it in the U.S. is sort of in a decentralized way. We say, look, if you're a big insurer or a big physician group, and you're buying your your things in bulk, then you can get a lower price than if you're not which makes some sense because that ha that's what happens in other markets, it makes very little sense when the uninsured person walks into the hospital and gets handed the highest bill or walks into the pharmacy and gets handed the, the, the highest bill for that. Um, the, 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 uh, I think, so I think there's partly a pricing issue. I, but I, I, to me, the, the, the thing about, so, so people here know that prescription drugs are overpriced, right? Let me ask you another quiz question. What share of all medical spending is for prescription drugs? How many say the answer is above 50%? How many say the answer is between 30 and 50%? How many say the answer is between 15 and 30%? The answer is it's actually below 15%. And you say, why is it that we focus on drugs so much and drug prices so much? And the answer is because that's where the insurance coverage is the worst. And so what, what, what we tend to do is we tend to focus on those prices that we pay. Hell, hospital prices are infinitely higher than that. And I th so I think a lot of the issue of people being concerned about costs are because insurance coverage is unstable. And the most obvious manifestation of that is I can't buy my drugs or I won't be able to buy my drugs. And one of the things, and, and, and in, in, when you look at sort of why people say that medical technology is bad, the biggest reason they say why is because it, it might push them into bankruptcy or it might push them into being uninsured or it might push the government into bankruptcy. None of those are real, real reasons. They're all side effects. And we've let the side effects run rampant here. And so structuring the, the organization in a way that minimizes the side effects is something we can do. Other countries do it, but we haven't done it yet. Hi, I'm, my name is Igor Gorlach. I'm a Rice University student. And Dr. Kather, you, you showed us the value we place, the personal value we place on technological innovation. And I feel that's a really good point. However, there is nations that spend almost as much as we do on, on technology, if not more, like Switzerland and Japan. And still they spend a lot less on healthcare. What do you think is the difference? And if that's cost containment methods, which one do you think would be most feasible or effective? to adopt? It's a great question. Why is it that um, other countries can do as well as us in terms of health outcomes for lower spending? Um, actually, there's no definitive paper on this, but let me give you my sense of what it is. And the, the example I'll focus on is Canada, which probably spends, we spend about 15 or 16 percent of GDP on healthcare, and they spend about 10 or 11 percent. A, a fair part of it is that doctors are paid more in the U.S. than in Canada. 
So a, a typical doctor's income in the U.S. is about 160,000. Typical doctor's income in Canada is probably about 100,000. And that's, some of that's just because there's only a single buyer in Canada and they lower prices. Some of that's because all highly educated people in the U.S. earn more. And so we just pay more at the top end of the distribution and medical care is more represented among the top end of the distribution. But that's one reason, it's the exact same. So all the doctors who, who complain about their fees going down, which they have been going down in many cases, ought to remember that north of the border they're even substantially lower. Um, a second reason why is um, the administrative expense of the US system is much greater than the administrative expense of a Canadian system. To my mind, the biggest thing we could do to reduce that will be a lot of the information technology things. Why is it we have people filing clerical stuff when computers do that in every other industry? And in fact, the biggest thing that computerization would do, I think, would be to cut out some of the, some of the middlemen from all of this. You know, my favorite example of administrative expense in healthcare is the company that sells to insurers programs not to pay, how to screen out bills they shouldn't be paying by, that doctors submit. And that same company sells to doctors a program how to get your bill paid by the insurer. So there's, your, there's administrative expense right there. The third reason is that Americans do get more care. If, you, if uh, two people with a heart attack go into a hospital, one in New York and one in Canada, the one in New York is much more likely to get intensive surgery than the one in Canada. The interesting thing is that Canada has kind of figured out how to get the surgery to the patients who most need it. And so they wind up with outcomes that are roughly equivalent. And a lot of the care that's um, in the, a lot of the additional care in the US would probably be this stuff here. And, it's, and, and so it's both the surgeries and then it's, you know, once you're in the hospital, there's so many more specialists and they do their tests and the, then even when, even when it's not materially important for the patient. Dying is extremely expensive, as someone mentioned. It's much more expensive to die in the U.S. than elsewhere um, as a, reflection, as a reflection, reflection of all of that. How big those three different things are is, um, uh, is a bit of a loss. And what you do about each of them, you know, each one has its sort of own, wrink own wrinkles. I suspect the U.S. will always continue to spend more, but it could certainly do some things that would bring it more in line with everyone else. Hi, my name is Norma Padron. I'm um, aspiring health economist. And um, I have a question. When you mentioned the value proposition, you mentioned about the pay for performance. And I kept thinking about doctors having to be insured against um, legal suits and the legal system being so involved, in particular here in Texas. I mean, we hear about outrages and, and sometimes are not. So where do you draw the line between, you know, a doctor <coughs> performing, you know, in the best interest of the patient and, you know, waste of money sometimes and just to be on the safe side for the doctors? Um. It's a wonderful issue, um, or a terrible issue, depending <laughs> on your point of view. L let me note one striking disparity and then, and then return to it. Almost every doctor will tell you that malpractice is an enormous influence in what he or she does. Yes. And almost every health economist will tell you they can't find evidence of that. And so, you know, you say, doctors will say, well, you know, they use twice as many services as they otherwise would because of malpractice. And all the economists say, yeah, I found about 2%. So I don't know the, the difference there. What, but the thing that's striking to me about it is that what it does is it creates a culture where, um, pun intended, you want to bury the mistakes, not learn from the mistakes. And no industry that's high productivity ignores the mistakes. In fact, it actually views them as a kind of learning opportunity. You know, so if you go to what is kind of currently the world's most admired corporation in terms of quality, Toyota, um, the whole, the whole gestalt of the company is about when, when something bad happens, being taking action right away and then figuring out what went wrong and how to deal with it and sort of building in that mistakes are going to happen and how to, and how to address them. And of course, in medicine, it's completely different. And I think that's probably the most invidious thing about malpractice, not so much does it lead to more being done or less because that's sort of uncertain, but what it says about the willingness to admit a mistake and to try and learn from a mistake. The other analogy that people sometimes draw is airplane crashes. You know, we don't just say, well, gee, an airplane crashed, oh well. We sort of investigate each one, painstaking detail, we sort of do it. Um, 
and then we try and learn about it and make any changes. If you want to think about that analogy in medical care, a number of hospitals um, in the Pittsburgh area decided they wanted to eliminate infections acquired in the hospital. So, you know, a fair number of patients go into a hospital for surgery, they wind up with infections and so on. And basically, the gentleman over here has it right. An enormous part of what you do is you make sure people wash their hands, you make sure that the line feeds are changed, that they're inserted the right way and stuff like that. One of the ways, so it's not rocket science, but one of the ways they did it is they all got together every quarter and they said, okay, we're going to go through each and every case to see what happens. And those doctors that were at the hospitals with lower rates went to the other hospitals and said, gee, at our hospital we rearrange things this way so that the thing doesn't become unsterile or whatever it is. And so just by sort of stuff like that, um, you wind up doing better and it's the kind of collaborative aspect rather than the, oh dear, if I admit this, I'm going to be in trouble and I'm going to get all these bad things happening to me. Um, and that's, I think, the biggest problem of malpractice is that kind of culture. Okay. Um, basically, my question pertains to the issue of uh, not doing what we should be doing. Uh, the question I've got, I guess we could use aspirin yeah, is your example or management of diabetes. Um, and since, furthermore, since we're, we're talking about spending money here wisely, how can we make that profitable? Aspirin, you know, because basically, presumably, if it's, you know, stopping things down the line. Let me give a couple of thoughts about it. And, and they sort of draw on the, the kind of things that I, that I, that that I mentioned, so let me take them in turn. Think first about the pay for performance. <laughs> some of taking aspirin, not all of it, some of it can be influenced by the doctor or diabetes medication, certainly. So for example, um, a doctor or an insurance company ought to note, let's say it prescribed you a 30-day supply of a statin drug 40 days ago. So it kind of knows that for 10 days, for some 10 days you haven't been taking it. Someone ought to know that and then ought to call the patient, say, hey, what's up? Do you really need more? Whether that performer is the doctor or the insurance company or a nurse or whomever, you want to think about paying someone to help out, and that will influence what patients do. So that's one end of it. A second end is the cost-sharing end. <coughs> so think about aspirin. Aspirin extends life. It may even save money. Why don't we pay patients to take it? Just say, look, your insurance premium will be lower. In fact, I can even do it, so let's say it adds to expense. I'll bet I can do it in a more revenue neutral way, which is I can say to the patient, I'm going to increase your insurance premium by $200 this year. <coughs> and every month that you show me some way that we come up with that you've taken your aspirin, um, I'll give you 20 bucks. So on net, I'll give back all the money to you, but because you now have this incentive to do it, patients will remember it. And we know from other stuff that that, that, that works for people, that a small monetary incentive can work. <laughs> and then the third way, the information technology, a lot of people will say, oh yeah, I forgot to take the aspirin, I forgot to renew the medication, and so on. It's actually um, not difficult to invent a pill box that beeps at you until you take the, the drug. In fact, you can do it quite easily. Um, a diabetic could have their blood sugar monitored continuously and sent by electronically to some computer where it gets watched and if the person's always got low blood sugar at 3 in the afternoon, someone calls and says, hey, why don't we talk about this before you have a coma at some 3.30. Um, the amount to which we use, in, in fact, you could actually have the insulin there and literally get put in, um, injected into the patient automatically. So the amount to which we use technology to help make our lives easier here is just minuscule. Um, you know, most people to get their kids asthma medication have to take off an afternoon from work. That's crazy. When either it ought to be able to do electronically or certainly by telephone or on nights or weekends. I, I would joke with the insurers in Massachusetts they should pay doctors less for seeing patients on Monday through Friday and more for seeing them on Saturday and Sunday. Someone said that was called an emergency room doctor. Um, so through all three of these strategies, you could think about doing something like that.
let me just make a few brief closing remarks. Um, first of all, many of you have been very generous and come up to me and said thank you for putting all the time into putting this conference together. But really, it's not much work on my part. It's actually a credit to the staff uh, in the Health Economics Program at the Baker Institute and our conference staff here. So, so Mara Short back there and Melissa Llewellyn, Christina Tia, and uh, our, our audiovisual staff, I'd like to give them a big hand. And um, this, is, this is the initial uh, version of this particular healthcare conference. We would actually like to hold this conference every other year and uh, make this an ongoing dialogue so we can see where did we start in terms of healthcare reform and every particular, every two years, come back and revisit the topic and say where have we come, have we learned every, anything from uh, our, our previous experiences. And, we're, um, and, and also because of that, we're going to be posting uh, the, the PowerPoints on, on our website and this is going to be part of an ongoing um, project we're going to work on this year of collecting various different proposals. I know some of you are interested in particular proposals and trying to get um, uh, some objective uh, critiques of these particular proposals all in one place so people can see this as a collection of information. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been wonderful discussion. If you would, uh, we're not going to send out um, a formal survey form, but we would very much appreciate your opinions on what you heard today, uh, what you liked, what you would like to hear more of in the future. So please feel free to email me at vho at rice.edu or healthecon at rice.edu. Either one of those will work. <laughs> Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you, thank you very much to our speakers who've made this a wonderful day.